I just want to introduce uh, Gina Chua, who you've already met uh, through her question. Uh, Gina is executive editor at Semaphore. She had been executive editor at Reuters. She and I worked together forever. Um, she's been responsible for graphics and for technology and for the budget and for administration and for safety and and uh, all new innovations at you know at Reuters and previously at at the Wall Street Journal. So uh, she's an amazing person to work with, an amazing person to run this panel, and I give you Gina Chua. Boy, Larry, we'll get you everywhere. <laughs> um, okay, so um, thank you for staying through the incredibly depressing panel. Um, but now we'll move to something a little more upbeat, which is the uh, coming robot apocalypse. <laughs> uh, but the good news is that we are not going to talk about the extinction of humanity, just journalists. <laughs> and, wow. and not journalism, journalists, because there's people that will talk about journalism, and that gets covered you know, a zillion times. But let's, we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of individual journalists, or at least small groups of journalists, and not how we're saving journalism, but really kind of talking about what journalists, how journalists should think about this, right? Because I just want to sort of just start with a little bit of a frame. Um, you know, so we do a lot of things in journalism, but a huge part of what we do, we're in the business of language. And large language models, LLMs, are in the business of language too. And they're transformative, and they will be transformative. Um, and we need to think about that in terms of the, the work that we do. Um, we're in the business of ideas, of discovery, of recognizing patterns. And it turns out that generative AI is pretty good at those things too. And so there is, I think, this, this point where we really do have to sort of think about how transformative this is going to be, whether we like it or not, um, on the core parts of our profession, our business, our public service, right? So that's, you know, small thing. That's so how, how do we, how should we think about all that? in terms of the risks and the opportunities um, for, uh, for both individuals and for, and for the business. So we have a great panel. We have Amanda Barrett, who's the VP of News, Standards, and Inclusion at the AP. The AP has just come out with uh, their um, AI um, style guide, which I encourage everybody to read and use. It's great. Um, <clears throat> we have Hilke Sherman, who's a professor here, investigative reporter, has done some really, really nice uh, work on um, looking at the um, I guess algorithmic accountability would be the, the, the right way to put it. And we have Mo Tamman, who I've known forever, um, who's done a zillion different, uh, really innovative things in the field of data and computational journalism, and the only person I know that come up with an entire investigative series just while floating on a sailboat out somewhere in the Hudson. <laughs> it's a really good series, too. Um, so let me just start. We'll do a round looking at the risks, we'll do around looking at the opportunities, and let's dig into that a bit and obviously get questions ready because I'm not that well prepared and you have to fill the time. <laughs> um, so let me start with risks. Amanda, what are the risks that you see in the robot apocalypse? <laughs> oh wait, so, was that a hint? <laughs> okay. uh, I will say there's, there's a lot of risk. I think, um, you know, with the machines, they're getting smarter, but there are lots of things that they don't know. They don't know nuance. They don't know shade. Um, we're not sure if what they're giving us back is true. That's a real risk. And if we rely on information that's not true, that can erode what little credibility we have with, with large members of society. So I think there's inherent risk in trusting the machines too much and giving them the power and not doing what we are supposed to do, which is employ our journalism skills to make sure that the data and the information that we gather is true as, mu as much as we can to be able to give context and nuance and to be able to produce real human stories. I'm sure all of you saw this week that Sports Illustrated was accused of having AI generate stories. That's a real risk. That's a risk to journalism. That's a risk to journalists. I don't want our folks to be replaced by machines. Our people are the heart of journalism. And without them, 
I feel like we lose the journalism, we lose the connections with our audience, we lose the ability to tell the truth. So I'm very worried about the risk. I know there's opportunity, but the risk weigh heavy on my mind. Thanks. And you know, and never mind Sports Illustrated, I think we all know about the CNET debacle. I don't know how it was like six months ago or so. So okay. Risk. Yes. Um so I don't think the robot apocalypse is coming. Sorry. Um I actually think that like uh we we live in a time and space where um technology is like super hyped. And I think our job is to look at like how it actually works, like what does it do? I'm not so interested in like artificial general intelligence. I'm sort of more interested in like how does it work, what we already use, um, and how does it not work? Um, and also how can we use these tools? Like I agree that there is uh, totally risk and I wouldn't use um, ChatGPT to, to write my articles because I, I wouldn't trust it. But I, I do think it's like wonderful to use and to build some presentations I've also you know English isn't my first language so actually like I'm afraid of writing some stuff so if I have like very complicated sentences I'm like let me send it there and ask it like very clearly like give me uh, a better version but don't add anything that's like the prompt you have to use um, and that has been really helpful um, so I'm not so sure you're I'm you're like, cheating really you're not you're not doing risks you're doing opportunities uh, tell me risk. Uh, the risk um, I think the risk is actually often in like over prescribing power to these machines and actually not looking deeper, how do they actually work? And like, what limitations uh, do they have? I think we are scared by our own fear. And I have the same fear. Sometimes I'm like, it's just like, you know, when I first started using ChatGPT, I was like, whoa, that is like powerful. And then it was like, oh, actually, wait, there's like real limitations here. Um, and we need to learn to work with the tools and like explore them. So, and then we can deal with the risk. Oh, risk. Well, I think um, the risk is we'll do what all journalists have been doing since the dawn of time and miss the opportunity to miss an opportunity. Um, I mean, there is uh, so much that can be done to make our jobs better, to make us better as journalists, to make our coverage better or more complete. And we can wring our hands all day long about the risks that face with these new technologies, or we can decide that we're going to embrace them and use them to our advantage rather than having um, uh, our own fear of our, uh, that existential fear of our existence overwhelm our need to use these tools because other people will and it will morph and the traditional journalists in this room will be out of work again because they chose to put their head in the sand and not take advantage of modern tools. So I'll just, you know, I, I'll cheat a bit and just talk about journalism in general, which, I, you know, it just sort of like put those two on the table. I mean, there's a lot of talk about um, a flood of disinformation. I personally think there's plenty of disinformation. I'm not sure that adding more to it is going to be a problem. But I do think there is a real risk of highly targeted, individualized, uh, persuasive speech that doesn't actually even need to be false, right? I mean, I, you, can, you, can, you can use um, LLMs to create very, um, very targeted, the same way that you know, we, we know how political campaigns reach out to people. So I just want to put that one out there, that that is one of the risks. But I, but I agree with you that one of our biggest risks is a lack of imagination. That, that in fact, even when we have imagination to think about using uh, the AI tools, we tend to use them for the things that we do as opposed to the things that they might do better um, than we do. So let's start going back the other way, Mo. What, are you, what would you say are the real opportunities here then? Can I say something about the deep fakes and, mm -hmm. and the generative text? So I think actually like, maybe I'm totally wrong with like, uh, you know, like sort of imagining the future, but I actually think that journalists are gonna be like really big on verification like there's going to be a lot of trash text or synthesis, you know, synthetic text. Like one of our jobs will be to actually uh, like verify like what is truthful and what is not. And I think we have to like bolster ourselves up to do that and to like do better. Um, but I think that's actually going to be. What a ping on you just for a second. Before, <clears throat> my fear isn't the creation of fake news. My fear is that I can craft a really persuasive argument by leaving out a lot of facts that you can't fact check. And I can do that. I would have to do it with you personally. I have to sit down and understand what your biases are and write to your biases. 
I can do that at scale now. And all of the traditional fact checking isn't gonna work. It's gonna be like, no, no, you missed the context, you didn't have this, what about that? What about the question you didn't ask? Countering that at scale, that's gonna be a really interesting question. All right, we interrupt it, this. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Regularly <laughs> schedule programming. Okay, Mo, uh, opportunities. What should we be doing? What should individuals be doing? And what should small groups be doing? So, if I, could, if I can suggest for a second that um, when, when the telephone was invented, right, and you called up somebody on the telephone, and you said, hi, Fred, this is Maurice from the Courier Post. That's where I worked when I would do stuff like this. Um, did you kill your wife today, oh. right? And they would say yes, and you say, great story. And you hang up the phone, and you write, and your editor goes, how do you know that was Fred? I mean, I, I, I mean, <laughs> to some extent, I think we're fundamentally facing exactly the same issues, right? All, and, and we just have to make sure to remember to do what we've always done, right? Um, I love, I was joyous, actually, when I first started working with um, the open AI um, <laughs> system programmatically. And I was searching for names for people who were arrested under a very specific set of circumstances. And there were hundreds of names. And every now and then I'd get a hit. And it would come back and it would tell me something. And this is really early, early on, right? And it produced citations and links and you name it. It was, it was like the most convincing thing, naming real people who had done these horrible, nasty, mean, and nasty things. Everything was fake. Everything was fake. I just had to click through the link and realize that they were perfectly constructed Reuters links, perfectly constructed to 404s, stories that never existed, right? I personally found that to be great. That's awesome, that's fun, that's interesting, right? But I'm never gonna rely on that, right? And if you understand the context of how these things operate, why, why? you're not gonna get faked out. You're gonna do your job, you're gonna verify just like you have always done. And, but they are the most amazing tools too. The ability to ingest huge quantities of documents and find some sense of order within those documents in ways that humans cannot possibly do, right? And that puts the power in your hands. Now you're informing the public in ways that they could never have been informed before, right? Forget about all the people who wanna cheat the world and fake stories. You as journalists now have the most remarkable tools at your fingertips. Use them, right? Learn them and give the public some real fundamentally different news. And I'm also of the belief that this technology could resurrect local news as well. Um, precisely because it can do stuff that tiny newsrooms by themselves can't do. And I think that the right entrepreneur could come along and with the right set of circumstances could make a ton of money covering local news once again. Um, let's hope it's not gonna end, sorry. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend anyone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so I think AI tools can be an amazing opportunity. Um, and I think, I think a lot about like frustrations as a journalist. So we built our first AI tool um, so, you know, I hold AI accountable, but I also kind of use it for journalism because I think it's like actually really helpful. Um, so what I did, I talked to um, uh, a friend of mine who's also a collab collaborator and was like, oh, you know, I file all these freedom of information requests and I get these like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents and there's not enough Saturday nights for me to look through them. And if I have to read one more email of this woman rescheduling lunch, I'm going to be really upset and I just need an AI tool that like fixes the problem. And she's like, okay, let's build it. And I was like, ha, 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 ha. Um, but we actually worked with like amazing uh, computer scientists and computer graduate students to build an AI tool that can um, sort of predict which of, you know, based on your keywords and context and, and what, what you're looking for, uh, uh, sort of make two buckets. One, this is likely you should read, and this is what you likely should not read. Um, and it's actually helpful. Like it, it brings down two thirds of what I need to read. It's never gonna find that, you know, like amazing, uh, um, uh, amazing moment because I don't really know what I'm looking for in these freedom of information requests, but it like actually cuts down on the noise that I have to read. And I think that's like, that's been super helpful. So like, I think like AI tools can be really 
um, amazing and can empower um, you know, freelance journalists that don't have the backing of large news organizations, like we can actually pull from others um, and other, you know, third party, you know, law firms use lots of data. So I always think about like, oh, what are they doing? Uh, is there something helpful that we can pull in uh, for as journalists? Because we go through like large sets of data and lawsuits and all of that kind of stuff. Like how can we use the technology to our advantage and build our own tools that might be helpful? Amanda. I think there's lots of opportunity in doing some tasks that journalists have to do manually that take a lot of time. Um, for us, I would say we compile, we have people all over the AP around the world that compile lists of what are the top stories in a given region or format that go out to customers. They all do it by hand. They all hate it. Is there a way that we can automate that process so that they don't have to do that? Is there a way that we can automate writing a story summary so that the journalist doesn't have to do that? I think if we can lift off some of those manual tasks that will allow people to do some of the deeper, more thoughtful work to actually get out in the community and talk to people, to actually go do the stories that they want to do instead of doing some of those things that they really, really hate. Can we use it to transcribe video for us? Um, we're already using it at the AP for, uh, for in our tool called AP Newsroom, which is where customers get content. They can do an AI-powered search and search for an exact moment of video that they would never just find just looking. So I think that there are real opportunities to raise up some of those manual tasks. I also think there's a lot of things that we just don't know yet will become opportunities. As we, as the tools get better, as we try them, as we experiment, I think there's gonna be a lot more things that we learn to do. Just like, you know, we started with Mr. Bell and his hardwired phone, and now we have cell phones that we use for every single thing. I think it will get better as we go along. Yeah, I would just sort of um, point a couple of things, right? One is obviously the fact that you can build a, um, uh, a custom bot with a couple of hours. I mean, I've started playing. Casey Newton wrote a, a piece in the platform about how he built a bot in half a day to, do, to copy edit his work and sort of help improve. I think one of the interesting things, just to throw it out there, so you know, I was at Reuters with Steve for a long time. Reuters is 2,500 journalists. I don't know, maybe a good third, half of them don't have English as a, as a uh, native language, and most of them have to write in English. I can imagine how much better their copy could become very I mean, you'd still edit it, but the point is they could actually improve their, 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 their copy. I mean, there's a lot, I think, that go there. But I mean, I think one of the questions is really, how, how much do you think we're going to be limited by imagination in terms of sort of thinking but what, what fresh things could be done. And I'll give you one example as a prompt. So I, um, 10 years ago, I spent a million dollars of Reuters money building something called Connected China, which is one of the most beautiful things we've ever built. Um, 18 months, 18 people, a million dollars, read every damn book about the, the, the power structure in China and then built into a database and mapped it. And I went and watched a demonstration at Microsoft about three or four months ago, and they showed a tool that just ingested the text, and boom, that was a network analysis. And I thought, oh, God, I just wasted a lot more. Well, anyway, that was a long time ago. I'm amazed I wasn't fired. Thank you, Steve. Um, but I'm just wondering, what, what sorts of things can you see just over the horizon that might be doable if we had the willpower and so on, and some money? So let me go back to a point of the conversation in the previous panel when they talked about the horse races, right? So let's talk about polling for a second. And I actually had some fundamental differences with some of the comments that were made during that panel because I don't necessarily have a problem with polling, but I do have a problem with horse race polling because it's the most subjective form of, of opinion polling there is because somebody has decided magically that these are the people who are going to show up to vote, that this election is going to look like this election or that election, and they'll go, we're going to predict who wins, and half the time we're wrong, right? Well, we had the polling when Trump beat Clinton um, that told us exactly how he was going to win. 
we, if you took the time to look at it, but nobody's taking the time to look at it, right? Because we're utterly focused on that narrow band and we're on deadlines and we're pushing and our clients at wire services, they want those horse race stories, right? So if we had a system that would ingest that polling and say, okay, here are the, all the scenarios that I can find. You know, and stop putting probabilities on it, but just simply say, if this group of people shows up at a higher rate, and that sh people shows up at a this kind of rate, the election could look entirely different, right? And I think that that will inform the reporting. A report comes, the, the poll comes out, and boom, there's, a, there's a, 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 a report that tells you, here are the scenarios. Now I have a sophisticated way of analyzing because I don't want to diminish the horse race story per se, because ultimately the people are reacting to those politicians and to the news and making choices about whether or not they go to the polls in addition to who they vote for, right? And analyzing the polling in a systematic way that humans cannot do and then report and then see what the, the trends are internally to that poll that we cannot immediately visualize, what a gift that would be to political journalists covering the, the race, even if we have to do the horse race stories. I mean, my hope would be um, if one day, uh, you know, I'm gonna dream big here, is like if like uh, uh, technical tools could understand the difference between correlation and causation because they're like a gigantic correlation machine and uh if they could like if, you know and it doesn't it doesn't have to be an understanding of, of a human consciousness just to find evidence that this is a causation uh, that these two things actually belong together and cause each other and they're not happen just both of them at the same time which is i think a lot of the problems that we see at least in 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 predictive ai um, that we see a lot of times that, you know, I don't know, I've done investigations into AI and hiring. There's companies that use our facial expressions and hiring to understand, are we going to be successful in a job? Um, I, I don't know what your facial expression in a job interview has anything to do with that. Uh, if Mo well was in interviewed on his facial expression, uh, <laughs> he would never get a job. Um, so, uh, you know, so like c c computers are very good at like bean counting our facial expression, but is that actually meaningful? No, it's not. Um, but um, so like if the com if we could get AI to do that kind of work, that would be really helpful because then we wouldn't have all these like correlations. I think that being able to turn the machines loose on all the reams of data that we have in so many places, just think about New York City and how much data it gathers in so many areas and what that could do to a beat that you're covering if you were able to actually see the trends and the data and be able to direct your reporting in that way, the most, the powerful stories that you could tell, I think, you know, if we could actually harness that power and be able to follow those trends, talk to people, I think we could bolster the actual journalism. And I do think that there are a lot of opportunities for smaller operations um, that just don't, they, they don't have the AP's power. They don't have the capacity. And they could use those two tools in a lot of different ways to see um, holes in coverage. They could use those tools to, to find um, communities that are un, undercovered. There's just a lot of different ways that we could use AI. Um, but as I said, I think there's a lot more to be done and we're, it's going to get better. I mean, we're just, we're at the, beginning of the road. So as it develops, there's just going to be a lot more opportunities to turn those tools onto some aspects of life that we haven't thought of. And that's why it's so desperately needed for people, reporters, journalists to get to know how those tools work and how to cover them in not an ooh-ah way, but a very serious way to understand the underpinnings and what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. Let me let me follow up on that in a second. So it I I 100% agree with you. Journalists need to learn more about these, and because the tools have become much more democratic, you no longer need to have like a whole tech department turn around and try and figure something out while you you know while you curse them. Um, so what what can and should journalists or newsrooms be doing to educate journalists? 
about what they can do? Well, first of all, learn the glossary. We put out a glossary of terms. <laughs> learn what they mean. Learn what information is being gathered in your community on your beat. You know, there is a lot of information that is gathered. Say you cover, <laughs> um, say you cover child care, and you know you cover um, a protective services for children. Learn the information that is gathered about the children. What, who's putting that information together? Um, is there any bias in that information? There's a lot to be learned if you spend time with the models, learning how they work, and asking good journalistic questions about how that information is being gathered, distributed, used, and what it means, and what it's used to predict. You know, are they, are they relying on this information to decide which children go to foster care and which don't. You know, there's a lot there, and decisions are being made about people's lives now using this information. It goes far beyond facial expressions. So I would say a responsible reporter, learn that information and then turn your journalistic skill on those tools so that you can understand how they work and how they're being used and how you can easily sometimes not so easily, but convey it to the public about what's happening. So I think short-term short, uh, short hope, could the AP build a chatbot for the US Census data? Because that stuff is like, is like amazing, the data, and it's like so inaccessible to the human mind is wild. That is As that would be like a short-term, uh, you know, it'd be a real service to anyone. Um, but I also feel um, that I think what might be really helpful um, to do? Sorry, I was gonna I was gonna pick up your your thought, and I lost my train of thought. Um, give me another trauma. What child services? Oh, child services. Yes. So predictive analytics. Um, I think actually testing the tools ourselves uh, super helpful. That's how I find half of the stories. I'm like, oh, I wonder how this tool works. Let me like you know, let me get a seven day trial. Um, and, and let me figure out what's what's under the hood and how does it work. Um, so I think that's like sort of how I generate most of my stories with like sort of curiosity and testing it. Um, and also like a good amount of skepticism. Um, so I think if you if 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 you're a reporter and you report on 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 AI, like the one thing to first thing to question is like sort of accuracy rates. Like you get a lot of like, yeah, it's 90% accurate, like, oh, it's really good for you. Great, and, and, and uh, was that in the lab or was that in the wild? How did you test it? How was the training data? Did that come together? Frankly, if your predictive AI tool is not 90% accurate, it's not very good. Um, so you really shouldn't be using it if it's not that high of an accuracy. But let's talk about it. Like, did you only have one training set and you had like one holdout data set? You take like 20% of that and, and then run your model against that. Well, you ran your own data against your own data so if you don't have 80%, 90% accuracy, that's really bad. Um, so like skeptical questions are helpful. Tease the tools. Like I uh, reported on a tool that was used to, you know, it's a lot of hiring and, and workplace because that's what I cover. Um, and there's actually a lot of AI in use. And every time you, you know, you send out a, um, an application for a job, AI will probably be used on you. Um, but uh, this particular tool was going to predict how well I speak English for hiring. So this was like marketed to, um, uh, companies mainly in the U.S. who need to um, hire call center employees overseas, and you know they need to speak English. Um, so this AI was gonna was gonna find out. So I spoke to it in English. I was very proud. I got an I got an 8.5 out of nine. I was like, wow, English is my second language. Like it's really good. This tool is good. And then I was like playing around with it. And I was like, you know, like I've talked to so many companies, and they told me if you have a disability, or you speak a second language, you know, speak a different language, or you have a speech impairment, uh, you know, th there would be an error message, right? Like the tool would find out you're under a certain threshold and, uh, you know, you would get a mistake. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me read something in German. That's actually my first language. So I wrote, uh, so I read, you know, Wikipedia uh, entry in German about psychometric, which is, you know, the, the, um, uh, this, the science of, of hiring and then finding out what the difference, mathematical difference are between us. And so I send it, you know, read it, send it out, and then I got an email back, and I got a six out of nine English proficiency, and I was like proficient in English. 
And I didn't say a word in English. And I was like, wow, this tool really works well. Wow. I want to know more. So, you know, it became a whole story. I talked to the developers. And, uh, you know, it was just very interesting and uh, to see how, the, how this works under the hood and how it may not work. And I don't, you know, I wouldn't know what to do with an algorithm. Somebody showed it to me. But I can sort of look at the results and be like, OK, how does this work? So I think that's really helpful to test the tools, play with it. Um, you just have to be careful with some of them with ChatGPT. Don't put text in that, you know, it's a scoop because uh, you don't know how, the, how your, how your um, data and text might be used. Um, but like play around with them. That's like how you get the best stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, along those lines, if I can continue, um, I have taken quite honestly to having a second screen dedicated to a chat bot next to me at all times while I'm working. And it's like having like the perfect assistant. And what, what's great about it is I don't ever expect it to be 100% right. I don't expect it to be 90% right. I don't expect it to be right half the time when I'm asking it questions. But I'm having a conversation with it about I can ask the vaguest of questions and it gives me a response and I say, you know, that's not right. I'm more interested in this. And so I'm having an engagement with this technology all day long and it's helping me to think. It's how, you know, we work from home most of the time now. I used to kick the dog. Now I don't kick the dog. I talk to my, my assistant who's <laughs> sitting next to me and we talk all day long. And it really is remarkably efficient in helping me to solve problems. And I think, you know, let's not expect these things to be perfect. They're not. Expect them to be imperfect, like the people who fucking made them, right? and use them, have conversations with them, just like you would a human who's sitting next to you. Now, it sounds ridiculous to think of it that way, but when you're working at home by yourself, you talk to lots of thing, inanimate objects. And then, you know, sometimes they don't give you good responses, but these things are sometimes pretty helpful. So what should we copy? Like, what were some helpful things that the, the, the Well, it's really, good, it's really good at coding. It's pretty good at grammar, I must say. You know, it catches the passive voice well, all the time. it's a language model. It's a language that's the, model. That's the key thing. We keep forgetting it's a language model. It's not a fact model. Right. Um, if so, I want facts, I'll ask Google, you know? So let me, let me turn this on its head for a moment, right? Because we've been focused really heavily on how it helps us as journalists, how it helps us in the reporting process. How could it help us essentially in the communication process? Um, you know, what could we do differently in terms of, of um, uh, either creating new news products or news delivery? And I'll give you a couple of examples. I uh, just met uh, recently this uh, Iranian-American woman and an Indian woman. They work for a, um, uh, a uh, exile Iranian media uh, uh, website. And they, you know, they have zero coding skills and they used it to create a Farsi language newsletter to get around some of the um, some of the access problems that people in Iran have reaching their site. Um, talk to um, some people from Brazil, again, very little coding skills. They took a, they had a, they had a story that they wanted to reach more people that you know, perhaps wouldn't have time to sit and read, and they licensed the voice of a, um, of a well-known um, uh, announcer, um, and using that made were able to sort of synthesize the uh, spoken version of the story in sort of both the dialect and accent that was necessary to reach the people that they wanted to reach. So just, I guess for a moment, just think about what are both the, 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 the opportunities here and to some extent what the, the risks uh, of all of this are. That example scares me. Okay, <laughs> go for it, go for it. <laughs> I don't want anyone synthesizing my voice, I just, uh... That just, um, that speaks fake news to me. Sorry, that sets off my news verification heart. Um, I, I think there's, there's lots of things that could be done um, in a different way. We have the issue too of parts of our newsroom do not speak English. They need to be able to communicate with each other. So I do think that there's opportunity there. Um, you know, certain people are not as involved in certain processes because they speak different languages. And could we 
um, enable them to communicate with each other. Can we build a communicator like in Star Trek? <laughs> That would be amazing. Um, I think that there's other opportunities for uh, different kinds of tools that you could use to figure out how best reach this audience. Uh, we already try to think about like for if I'm going to use social or if I'm going to print a story, what's the best SEO? But how do I know um, how best to tell a story to reach an audience that I want to reach. Is, should it be a text? Should it be a video? Should it be photos? Should it be interactive? Could a tool help me figure out, out the best way to tell that kind of story? So I could use the tools in ways to help tell the journalism in the broadest reach that can reach the audience I want to reach. You can do some A-B testing. You could also like um, you know, and, and there's already kind of like journal pilots that help you with like your story. You can put it in and then it pops out like here's a possible tweet. Here's like a LinkedIn post. So like that could be really helpful with with day to day work. Um, I'm not against I don't know if I like my voice particularly. So I don't know if I want to clone it in other languages. I don't have like a problem with like experimentation. I'm just like really worried that like my voice would be in a language that I don't understand, but I'm thinking this is like the things that I said in English are like accurately tra translated. And I think that would scare me to put out like news in other languages that I'm not sure is this actually correct. Um, and I think I, I do feel a lot about like, um, you know, like transparency, like, okay, this is like not actually my voice. I didn't say this, this is like a deep fake of my voice. Um, I think those things are really helpful when you test technology and use it. Um, would you be okay with like radical transparency? And if you're not, probably don't use it in a public context. Um, you know, play with it. I certainly deep fake my voice for like tests. It's also really fun. Um, so, um, but would I be okay with like um, deep faking my voice in other languages? Probably not, even if I would say this is my deep fake voice. Yeah. Different fonts, you know? We change how our stories appear in newspapers versus the web, right? So we change the voice that's used to, to, to read the script that a human has written. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with that, you know? What, you, I mean, as long as it's real, as long as the words are real that we've, we've created, I don't see a distinction between this is the voice and and the word on the on the page or some fake avatar sitting there going and today's news is you know um, I don't know as long as as long as the words are, are, are journalists words how they are communicated to me is I'm agnostic I don't care well we're gonna park that for a second and just turn to the floor questions Fine. All right, okay, question. You referenced connected China, and I, and I don't like the B word too much, but I thought that was one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. Now, my kind of ethics disclosure question is, when I saw that, I realized a lot of effort had been put into it. I didn't know it was a million bucks, and I didn't know it was 18 people, but because it was Reuters, and because I really, I even f tried to fact check some of it just for the hell of it because it was so deep. I trusted it. I believed it. Now, if we're into AI, and it's say it's Reuters or it's mm -hmm. the AP or you know pick your pick your organization, and you sort of implied that you could have done connected China with the machine. Should I believe it? I mean, it's a good question, but I mean, look, we use, I guess what I would say, I'm, I'm a little more on, on the, the, the Mo side of the spectrum, I think. I think ultimately you do have humans against, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the thing, we use a ton of tools, right? We, we use spreadsheets um, every day. Well, maybe not. Maybe not you every day. I use spreadsheets every day. Um, and at the end of it, you know, it adds something up, and I, you know, and you sort of that, that, did anybody check that? Yes. I mean, it's like it's not like I took that and it just went out. 
But I mean, I'll take other examples. I mean, Reuters and the AP and Bloomberg and various other people auto-publish um, some machine-generated news, right? I mean, sports stories, some of the stock market stories, um, certainly at Reuters. Um, that information, you know, is it 100% accurate? No, it's probably 99 point something percent accurate. You, what's the accuracy, accuracy rate on humans? Right. It's not that much better, right? So the point is you build systems. It's always about building systems. And ultimately, you're putting your organization's reputation on the line. You screw up too many times, sports illustrated, seen it, um, then you have a problem. If you, if you are, you know, if you built good enough systems, I think, I mean. Can, can I just throw another scenario? You go to your GP, right? And you've got a weird thing going on inside your chest. <laughs> Sorry, I have the same problem. <laughs> and your doctor says, well, I don't think it's anything, right? And here are my symptoms, and the doctor says, well, it seems like nothing to me, right? But this doctor has been doing this for 35 years and has stopped reading the academic papers, isn't following stuff anymore. But you trust him, your family's been going there, right? Now, if I went and sat down in front of a computer and I entered, or had a conversation even, with a bot, and these are my symptoms, and the bot says, you know what? It's very rare, but these symptoms are sometimes being associated with this particular disease. Now, this is something that your GP would never pick up on, ever, because they haven't read an academic paper for 15 years, right? Now, that report can go to a doctor who can analyze it, who's more familiar with that disease. These are opportunities, and I think the same type of thing is possible for journalism, right? the opportunity to see things that we cannot see because we are small-brained, right? And it's nothing against us, it's just the way we are. But when you can access neural networks across, you know, gigantic buildings and thousands and thousands of cores, there are opportunities to learn and to assimilate information that we cannot do. And it can make our world better as long as we control it. Just stay in control. I do think, though, we should not ignore the fact that these things are built by humans mm -hmm. and there will be built-in biases and inequities. Yeah. And, you know, we've all seen some of these things that have come out of biases. And I think we need to be cautious because um, we can see that uh, these inequities show up for underrepresented communities, sometimes women, we see the effects. So I don't, I understand wanting to use them, but we need to be realistic about who built them and what the problems can be. And, you know, the fact that they can give you false information is a really well, big Well, that's problem. a, that's a, it's, it's, it's not, that's a little bit, that's not necessarily true. They, they are systems that are set up to give you answers from strict to loose. And you, you can be in control of those things. You can control them. But loose them. can be wrong if it's having a hallucination. Well, but, Am no, I no, no, if it's, it, it's not gonna, <laughs> it's, it, it hallucinates as it moves further from the spectrum from strict right, to loose, and I'm using my terms here, but those hallucinations occur because it's been given the latitude to... But, to but Amanda's brought a point, I think, really, is that there is bias in systems, and what we do have is the ability to do bias at scale, and that's one of the things we do have right. to think about. But here, here, okay, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate with you, and we'll go back to the doctor's example for a second, right? Um, I'm a, a, a black woman who goes to the doctor, right? And this system has access to all the medical research that has been published in the last 35 years and is particularly attentive to research that affects black women, okay? It is possible to build a system that is particularly attentive it, to those people who have traditionally been the, the, key, um, the key question un, is, under, do we un, build under those service. machines or do we right. not build yeah. those machines? And, that's and then the is that problem. medical research done on those people, which I would hazard a guess 
not as much not as, as much. Yeah. I, I'll give others. you that. Yeah. Well, okay. and also wait, wait, like wait. the the medical research necessarily, you know, that's why we see algorithms in healthcare like replicate those biases because mm -hmm. right. the problem is like it will take somebody like Andrew Wakefield and like think that like vaccinations cause autism because there have been scientific papers about it. If the machine would ingest that. Um, and not necessarily see well. It's been like fifty thousand uh, corrections. I'm, miss I'm calling a halt to this part, and because <laughs> there are questions, <laughs> we can go up for a long time. Trust me. Good, Tom. Hi, thanks for the great discussion. I'm curious. Um, you you should introduce yourself. I'm, well, oh, I'm Tom Rubin. I work at a company called OpenAI. Um, yeah. I'm curious what you think, and, and hence my question, which is. What would you like to see the AI companies do to further the objectives that we all have? How that... much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as much time as you'll give it. But but I, I'm I'm really curious how the 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 technology companies can assist and ensure, from your perspectives, that that AI is used in the field of journalism for good to promote all the societal objectives that that we all. Believe. You have an opportunity of a lifetime to go. It's <laughs> citations, citations, citations. Um, I oftentimes struggle to figure out where the information is coming from. Um, I think that uh, Bing is doing a better job because it'll show you how it's iterating through different searches. Um, but I find myself when I'm working with OpenAI and True Confessions, I actually prefer the conversational style of the chat GPT than I do Bing, but I also prefer the citation style. And when I'm, when I'm struggling to figure out where the information came from, and that's really important, I will flip over to Bing and I'll do my work over there because I know I can find reasonable citations for my work. So I guess what would be great is like, if tools could like mark the hallucinations, um, but I, I know that they're obviously not like thinking machines. Um, so, but like, you know, so, sort of like, you know, I, I, I tried to like um, have my syllabus uh, generated by, by chat, chat GPT and I was looking at like all these like amazing people that I know, like who've written these books. I was like, oh, I didn't know this. Mark wrote that book, wow, cool. And I was like, I looked it up and I was like, oh, Mark didn't write, write that book, but he is an influential uh, in, in, in investigative reporter. So it would have been great to mark that, that there actually isn't Mark never wrote that book that it thought that it invented. Yeah. So that 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 would be great. It's like very very con convincing text. So that would be put helpful. In italics, you know, just put the hallucinations in italics, and that would be awesome. That would um, know. That would be great, and also like having like a battery of tests um, before tools are being put out, and to sort of like understand the limitations a little better of the tools. I think that would be really helpful, and. Um, maybe that is not so much about generative AI, but some of the predictive AI, like the idea that, um, and I think we as humans have to be like much more critical about this, to really think through like, can we actually predict um, when kids need to be going in foster care and like all those kinds of things, like can we actually, or can we predict the future that one of us will be successful on the job? Because there's actually so many parameters around that and it's not only your ability to do the job but like your family situation like I mean there's all kinds of things like can we actually uh, use that kind of uh, tools like um, and I think that would be really helpful to be skeptical about that what's your wish list? transparency uh, honesty about where the information comes from honesty honesty about how it's being used um, and I would say being willing to accept some guardrails, not only for journalism, but for the broader society and being able to, and, and willing to explain what you're doing. Because I think a lot of people have no real, con they know AI, that's all they know. And in order for this to really take hold in a way that is good for society, and the world at large, um, people need to understand what's happening with their information, where it's going, and how it's being used, and um, and whether or not it's profitable for them, not only for the companies, for us as a society. I have three specific asks. <clears throat> One's very personal. 
Uh, one, uh, and this is gonna be really boring, but I am a systems person, SLAs. Um, what I've done, what I've done in terms of playing with tools is, you know, I'll do something and tomorrow it won't happen. Tomorrow it won't work. Tomorrow, and I understand the systems are being uh, iterated on all the time. They get better, they get worse, they get new things. And the problem is, for anybody who's building a truly dependent tool, you need to lock that down at some point. You need to be able to to, to buy ten hours of. GPT 3.995 or whatever it is, because otherwise you build something and the next day it doesn't work, right? So SLAs would be free SLAs for journalists. That would be nice. Um, the second one is just the ability to experiment much more easily with um, building your own bots. And I know that there are tools out there. I've started to play with it on Poe, um, which leads me to my third ask, which can you please like approve my waitlist thing for GPT-4 because I'm waiting and I can't get in on it? That would be nice. Thank but Gina, you. you can just pay for it. No, I'm trying to pay. They won't let me. I'm on a waitlist. Oh, can you, you're still can on you, the waitlist? Can wait you fix the waitlist? Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Um, do you think that... Um, legacy newsrooms have the imagination and resources to innovate here, or is there going to be a wave of startups that will lead to our I'm leaving now. Um, <laughs> wait, you might notice I'm not at Reuters anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so, it's a little bit unfair. Do legacy newsrooms have the imagination? I mean, I think we, like any other creative people, we have imaginations. For us, I think the challenge is resources. I mean, just to do the daily reporting that we need to do on two wars, as well as many other stories in a lot of different places, is a financial challenge. So I think that there's a lot of imagination, and I think there's will, but resources are a real challenge. I, what, well, I mean, I've been given the, the five-minute warning, Mark. So we'll get one really quick question, and I want to get a bunch of um, uh, final message. So um, I think you, you win the lottery. <laughs> local news. And you know, the tragedy of the death of local newspapers is so important. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see that? Because I mean, we've been talking about mining data and translating and changing formats and all these things. But Local news is like being there, right? right. So, so imagine, imagine you had a town that had a planning board, a zoning board, a city council, a um, couple of other ancillary boards, right? They meet regularly. They create minutes. Every, everything is, is documented. You can ingest that. You can ingest that over time. You can see all this planning, all the approvals for building, all that kind of stuff, right? Campaign finance, you name it, it can all be ingested. And when things start, let's take, for example, a city council that hasn't met an executive session for five years, right? And no one goes to these city council meetings except maybe the mayor's mother. Um, uh, no journalists show up, but then all of a sudden, five meetings in a row, they go into executive session. Why is that? Well, no one was there to catch that, but you can certainly imagine a large language model that would be ingesting these minutes of these meetings and going, huh, they haven't done that before. Let, I could write a story about that, or I could notify one of the five journalists who now will no longer have to go to those meetings and plow through all those, those things and say, I think there's a story here. They've gone into executive session five times in the last five weeks, right? They don't have to say what it is, but that behavior is different. It can be detected, and you go and do a story. Now, imagine doing that across all the departments, right, with all the public information. Now you've got all these tips coming all over the place, potentially even having short stories written. There's a new shopping mall going up. There's a new strip mall that's been approved. There's, a, there's an oak tree in the middle of town that is going to be cut down, and they just got approval to do it. These types of small things could be written about, right? But the bigger things, the, the behaviors, the, the patterns that have shifted and changed, those can be detected. 
And then you kick those to the five reporters left to cover the whole community. The whole state potentially, right? But now you're taking a reporter and instead of having them do drudgery, you have them doing the important stories that are holding the local leaders to task in ways they were ne they haven't been able to do in 25 years. I, I would also recommend that you get in touch with Gabe Kahn at USC. He's got a project called Cross Town, um, which ingests data exactly as Mo suggests from all around um, the municipalities and analyzes it and generates some of those exact same type of reports. Um, just before we uh, round up, I want to just go to each of you and say, <laughs> So as a practical matter, what can a journalist do tomorrow differently, having now heard us talk? What's your advice? What should they do tomorrow that they didn't do today? If you are, learn about AI. Make it your mission to find out what are the right, what's the right terminology, how these tools work. Read the AP style book about how to cover <laughs> AI because it is going to affect every single beat out there. And it's important for you to be able to understand the language and to understand how to explain it to audiences so you can tell them what's going on. Um, and it's not just crime and crime stats, it's, it's entertainment. If you look at what just happened with the strikes in Hollywood, part of that was about AI and whether or not people will have jobs, whether or not they'll actually get to practice their craft. It affects art, it affects, it's gonna affect so many things. So make sure you understand what is happening and you keep on top of it. You keep on top of the conversation, you keep on top of all the books and the articles because it is, if you, especially if you're just starting out in journalism, it is going to be with you the rest of your career. Okay. Um, so I think what might be helpful is like, um, so I'm gonna like uh, start dedicating like five minutes or 10 minutes a week to just like try out a new tool and see what others have done. Like, you know, like look at like what, what tool have they used and like try it out. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's really helpful. Um, and then I think what's also helpful is like thinking about like how have other reporters held uh, technology accountable. So like, how have they done this investigation? Like I always like look at people's methods and sort of like, okay, how can I, how can I copy them and copy my methods too? Cause that will all help us um, to sort of think through technology. Um, I, I, I would, just, let me just, I remember when I got my first brick cell phone and it was about this big and I got my first call from a source drunk off my ass at a bar in Sarasota, in Melbourne, Florida, right? And I got a great story out of it, right? And that was my first op opportunity. I was like, oh my, it was eye-opening. I'm drunk, I'm doing an interview, and I got this story. It was awesome. I, I did go back and call him again when I was sober, just to be clear. But that story came in while I was drinking at the bar with a phone that was about that big, right? This technology is no different in that regard. What I'm saying is tomorrow when you get up, and I said this before, have an assistant. Have a friend sitting next to you and just see how efficient and how helpful it is, right? And be jaundiced about the information they're giving you because half of it's rubbish, but you'll have fun. You'll have a decent conversation when, with, when instead of sitting at home by yourself, just bang on the keyboard. That's my suggestion. Thank you. And my suggestion is just play. Play with the tools. You're not going to, it is a completely different visceral experience to actually do them than to, than to read about them and, and things will come to you. So anyway, with that, thank you. But thank you very much for all of you being here and thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, before I let uh, th thank you so much for a wonderful panel. Before I let you go, um, I do want to thank our generous um, financial supporters, uh, the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, where you are today. Um, OpenAI, represented here by Tom Rubin and his family. And Craig Newmark Philanthropies. I also want to note that the granddaughter of Arthur L. Carter is here today. So uh, please uh, welcome Sophia Carter. And thanks for being here. We, we use the name every day, so 
we're, we're delighted to do that. Also, please, uh, whoops, the QR code went away. I was gonna say, please make sure to use the QR code. Can, can we bring it back? It's down here because it's got great resources related to this that our staff has worked really hard to put together. There's articles, there's uh, guides, there's uh, ethics codes. So um, please uh, go after that before you leave. And thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Take care.